Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 3rd, 2013, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, I swear, I really, really mean it. Got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew did not compensate me for this endorsement. But uh, hey, PepsiCo, if you're out there, let me know. I watched a video this morning on how to make Mountain Dew glow, so um, I have to show that to my daughter later on today. She'll get a kick out of that. Mm, good stuff. Makes you wonder, wonder what kind of chemicals are in there. I don't know. Whatever it is, it's good. All right, enough of that silliness. Let's get started. Oh, before we forget, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That's the short version. Um, obviously, the long version is there right in front of you, or will be as soon as the software catches up. All right. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. You read the book? You like the book? I don't know why you're here if you didn't. <laughs> uh, put me up a review on Amazon. I'd appreciate that uh, a lot. Anyway, uh, what's going on? Uh, first, a couple little bit of housekeeping. I'm, I'm going to rush through this like I normally do, but the fact that most of you know all this uh, that are here, there's no need to spend a lot of time on this. One thing I do want to point out, if you do like the shows, and I tell you what, if I say so myself, there's a lot of good stuff in these, and it's just a tremendous amount of information. And I'm very proud of this uh, this work. I know it's a little vain, but I think um, there's some good stuff in all these shows. And I got the second half now archived and available on a flash drive. If you want the whole year, I'll put them all in one drive for you. And the feedback has just been phenomenal on that, and I'm very proud of the work. And as you know, I stand behind everything I do and answer questions and uh, and so on. Anyway, that's it on that. First two books are still available. There's some information on that. If you want them both, let me know. I'll cut you a deal on both of those. What else? I think everybody else knows the rest of this stuff here. If not, if you need some charts, let me know. Um, if you're interested in the service, let me know. There's some information on that down here. All right, let's get you can tell I got a lot to cover. I really don't want to spend a whole lot of time on housekeeping. I don't want to spend too much time telling you what I'm going to tell you, so let's just get through this really quick. I want to talk a little bit about news. I want to talk about the importance of the occasional big winners. And I want to talk about discretion, uh, how it uh, shakes out with that. I do want to also touch upon a few things that I touched in the last webinar a few weeks back on um, trend following in 2012. And, uh, of course, anything you want covered, we'll start taking thoughts on your subject. And we do have some Q&A in here, too, to cover. Uh, let me talk about trading news events. And one of the most significant events, events that I think of, um, what I think of news is would be like a, at least an individual stock it was the death of Steve Jobs, and it was pretty much um, inevitable that it was due, uh, you know that that you know Mr. Jobs was towards the end of his life. When I was uh, speaking in fall of uh, 2011 at a, uh, a conference in Dallas. And um, anyway, I, I got asked about how is that going to affect Apple. Of course, everybody always wants to know about Apple. And I said that when he does die, see what the market does on that day, and then look to go long above that high. Now, he actually died on the 5th. Uh, I guess it was pretty much inevitable on the 4th, though, and that's why you saw the sell-off here. Now, when you have bad news in a market, and then that market immediately discounts it, that's usually telling you something. It means that it's already factored in, and you could actually look to go long. So if you look to go long above that high, you would have gotten long here, and it would have taken off. And that's what I said in the seminar. I'm not a news trader, and I don't pretend to be a news trader. But when asked about it, I said, okay, well, I don't know what the longer-term effect for Apple is going to be. You know, obviously, it's going much higher than this. But what I said was, Keep an eye on Apple the day that uh, Mr. Jobs dies and see what the stock does. And if it sells off, look to get long above that high for a news reversal type of play. And you can see Apple had a pretty good run after that. Now, I just want to, the reason I'm bringing up news is because we've had so much news lately in the market. And we've been in this event-driven event environment. And go back and look at the last few months. And we had the... Um, we had the European bailout, and I said to everyone, if we take out that low, then the market's going to sell off. 
And then on top of that, we had the U.S. ongoing bailout. And I said if we take out that low, the market's going to sell off. So the market did trigger, so to speak, on that news event. And notice that it didn't go down right away, but it did have a significant drop. And even if you're measuring off of that European bailout low, which I think that our bailout trumps this bailout on Newsday. But even if you entered on that one, you got a little bit of a sell-off out of that. So for the most part, it sold off fairly hard. You Notice the market made the high the day after our bailout, this ongoing bailout. And although it went sideways for a while, it did have a significant sell-off afterwards. Okay. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because obviously we had the fiscal cliff uh, BS news or BS stuff, whatever you want to call it, that happened uh, yesterday. And all of a sudden, a switch got flipped and, hey, everything's okay. Fiscal cliff averted, blah, blah, blah. And the market had the mother of all rallies. Well, I would keep this 2014-25 in mind, and I would watch that as an inflection point. By the way, it always amazes me. Market goes straight up one day, and then the next day it goes, it's like it's almost like everybody their brother bought, and there's no one left to buy on the following day. But I always find that a little fascinating. Anyway, I digress. Getting back to the news events, like I said, you wait for the news event. Let's say the market goes up on a big news event. They look to fade that news, short the market when it comes back in, okay? So let's say the market goes up, closes up here. Look to fade it when it takes out that news event low. If the market goes down on some sort of news, okay, look to go long when it takes out that news event high, okay. So in this particular case, I think this is worth watching. Now, I'm again, I don't trade directly off of it, so you're like, well, why are you telling us? Well, because it's important. I think that you have to sort of put all the pieces together. Like I said last week and possibly the week before that, or two weeks ago, I should say, um, you know, I'm a trend guy, and I'm looking for trend. And I'm constantly trying to seek that trend or change in trend, but I do factor in a few other things into my analysis. And in a few minutes, I'm going to touch upon retracements, which we talked about a few weeks ago, which isn't uh, directly related to trend once you get beyond a certain part point. And I talk a little bit about overbought and oversold sometimes. By the way, the market is very overbought right now, so it's a very dangerous environment to buy into. And another thing to watch out for is and I'll talk about this in random thoughts. I'm getting so far ahead of myself. But it's almost like there's some performance anxiety out there where people feel like they have to rush in the market to feel like to, or risk being left behind. Problem with that is, is that that tends to be hot buddy, and they tend to bail out of the first signs of adversity. So I think that makes 1425 even more important, okay? So keep an eye on that level. Again, as I've said time and time again, I don't like these V-shaped recoveries at high levels. Okay, you got a trend, and then you got this sell-off, and then it just makes a sharp retrace back up. And the reason big is it just has a hard time sustaining that rally, building that leg on a leg. And again, I'm getting ahead of myself once again. But the bottom line is watch. Monday's high as an inflection point on Monday's close. And the reason I'm saying Monday's close is because if you look at like the spiders, you're going to have a big gap in the chart. Okay. The market actually didn't trade at 1425 yesterday, it gapped above that. Um any questions on factoring news into the equation? Ignore all news, okay? But when you see a market do something opposite of what it should, or if you see that market reverse of that news shortly thereafter, then the market's trying to tell you something. Okay, I didn't update this uh, chart. This is from a few weeks back. But I talked about how the market did trend a little bit earlier in the year, pull back trend. It was looking pretty good. It was pretty fired up back here. Big Day was printing money. Looks like it was having the best year of his life. Uh, except for maybe 1999, right? And then, you know, market begins to sell off. Well, wait a minute. It looks like it's going to sell off. Nope, kind of fake out. Okay, back up. Oh, yep, yeah, there we got a real sell off. And then it looks like it was going to be a nice little tread, thrust, tread, thrust, thrust, tread, thrust, tread, right? So right when you get fully positioned here, 
the market, as I said a couple of weeks ago, went up and down and up and down and up and down. By the way, I was looking through my charts this morning. One thing that's kind of cool, if you connect the lows to the highs, like I'm doing here, okay, that low, that high, that low, that high. And if you did that throughout this little thing, you could see that it was a very painful choppy trend where, yeah, the market went higher. You could draw an arrow, but it did it so like this. And it was a horrible, horrible time to trade. So I've got this little caveat. Great year to start trade trading. Well, Dave, the market was all over the place. Why would you say that? I mean, look, it just kind of went sideways here. Oh, look at that nice little sell-off. Nope, turn around, went straight back up. It was a horrible year to trade trade. But providing you're still here, it was actually a good year to start trading. Now, why would I say that? Well, I would say that because most people go through this trader's journey. And if you've been around these presentations, you've seen, and it's one thing I love to speak about when I'm out uh, speaking, not that I speak that often, but maybe once a year in the States, if that much. But uh, whenever I get out, I often show the chart with about 50 indicators on it. So many indicators, you can't even see the chart. And most traders go through this, what I call the grail hunt. They start with a blank chart. And the reason I'm showing you this trader's journey today is, let's say that the conditions were good up until here. And they were making a lot of money. And then all of a sudden, conditions went bad. Okay, so once they start going bad, all of a sudden, the traders, or most traders, going through this trader's journey, begin to start adding indicators on. And before you know it, they're adding more indicators. And the further they get into this journey, the more confusion begins to set in. And the harder and harder it becomes to actually see the chart behind all of the indicators. And at some point, they end up doing uh, what I call, again, the Holy Grail hunt, where you start studying the complex of the arcade. You go through some sort of bar counting method or some sort of wave counting method or some sort of arcane method. I'm not going to say the person's name. There's a couple of them out there. Where it's all this bizarre stuff, and they claim that you can predict the market using all this bizarre stuff. And then at some point, provided they stick with it, they reach a level of frustration. And then the true enlightenment comes in. They begin removing indicators. And there's a perfect quote about that. It's like when you, when you reach the beginning, you have... Um, I forget how it goes, but there's a there's a great quote. I'll dig it out. I actually got it from John Bollinger, and uh, he I think got it from The Hobbit or something. But it was, it's a great it, it's a great quote about the true enlightenment comes when you end up back at the beginning, and hopefully that makes sense. So when you get back to this blank chart, that's when you get the true enlightenment. Now, this journey can take nine to ten years from what I've seen. But the great thing is if you start doing poor conditions and good times follow bad by the way so let's say the market's doing this then it's due to do this. Unfortunately just the opposite is true. If it's doing this or doing this then it is often due to do this. Okay, So that's one thing that's a little uh, strange is that uh, good times follow bad but unfortunately bad times follow good. But this journey, like I said, it could take about a decade to go through. And I've seen a lot of people go through it. My favorite clients have been through this journey, been through this entire cycle. And they come back to me and say, hey, Dave, I know your stuff is not perfect, but it makes sense. And I can see how it can work, when it can work, and where it can work. So you're much better off. Give me a trader any day who starts during a market like this as opposed to a trader who starts in a market like that. Okay, and I guess I should say starting a little bit later in 2000. Let's say you start around right here. And it's so funny. Uh, I have clients, and, you know, let's say they started here. They get this ride up here. 
and I get all these accolades from them, and then this happens. It's like, you know, hey, your system's great. Hey, your system sucks, you know. <laughs> so you have to live through a few of those cycles. So good times usually follow bad. If I had to bet on a trader, I would bet on a trader that starts doing – during um, good times, I'm sorry, during bad times and sticks it out, toughs it out. And the reason being is that person's expectations are tempered. Those people who start doing good times, they don't know what hit them when that first drawdown or that first choppy market comes along. Okay. Lewis says, what will the market do over the next three months? Choppy? Question mark. I don't know. Okay? As I've said before, when you look at my little um, graphic that I often show that explains the methodology, in the market, like predicted the weather, you could only predict the short term. And my favorite short term indicator is a reversion to the mean move within a trend okay so if you got a trend and the market pulls back there's a fairly certain chance that that stock or market will begin to revert back to its mean from that oversold condition in the direction of longer term trend the big question mark is way out here you don't know where it's going to be a week from now a month from now a year from now or 10 years from now that's where the money management comes in which we're going to talk about in a little while okay but you can only predict the short term when it comes to the markets, but you can stay with a winning trade as long as it remains a winning trade. An example I always use was the stock we stayed with for two and a half years. Okay, I'm slighted as a swing trader. They put swing trading in the title of my first two books. Notice that I made sure I took it out of the third book. But the reality is I will stick with the position as long as it moves in my favor. Now, I did. I was a little bit more of a short-term trader, but that was more in the go-go days when you were stupid to stick with anything that wasn't just going straight up, okay? But you can only predict the short-term when it comes to the market. No one's no markets. No one knows what the market's going to be a year from now. It's, it's, this is the funniest time of the year for me because I don't watch any TV anymore when it comes to markets. But uh, – I bet you, oh, I don't know, I, I, it's it's not even a bet worth taking. There are all the predictions out there for 2013. I'm sure on certain networks there's probably certain people that are telling you what the market's going to do over the next year. And nobody has that kind of crystal ball because all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Terrorist attacks. The economy can fall back into recession. You name it. The list goes on and on and on. Nobody knows all those things. But you can look at the market, and provided things are set up, and you have some sort of clean pattern, and get a pretty good idea where the market might be headed. What instrument would you be trading here on the news, an ETF or individual stock that's set up? Well, I'm not going to trade the news, James, unless I see some sort of, maybe if I see an opening gap reversal or something, then I might uh, take it. But you could use the spiders or anything like that. You don't you'd have to get fancy um, with it or use any type of derivatives. Just spiders is fine. Okay. One thing I've been talking about lately is, did a switch get flipped? And it seems like we went from this bear mode, all of a sudden flip, bull mode. Unfortunately, it's not that easy, okay? So all of a sudden now, the switch is flipped and we've averted the uh, fiscal cliff. So there's nothing to worry about, right? Ha ha. Well, there's always something to worry about, right? Um. I guess the main problem that I'm worried about, as I alluded to earlier or even talked about, is that – this is a slide left over from a couple of weeks ago – is that the johnny come lately tend to rush into the market at the absolute worst possible time. You've got a lot of people that got burnt in the markets 
over the last few years, especially 2008, right? And they've kind of like, oh, I learned my lesson. I'm going to stay out of the market. Well, the market's going up and up and up and up and up. And so what do they do? Well, they feel like I better get back in this market because it's going up. And if I don't get in, I'm going to be left behind. And they tend to come in at the worst possible time, but they also tend to be hot money. So the psychology of these people is, and, and you know, here's some fodder for research. I'm always talking about things to think about. And I've always talked about how uh, markets can be a little choppy post bear market, right? And that it's not necessarily a new paradigm we're in, where we're in this choppy market. It, it might just be a choppy market after a big bear market like we've seen throughout history. But it takes a while for those memories to get through the system. So I, I, I don't know how you would quantify it or study it. But there's probably a way you can go in and look at what happens after bear markets and base that on the psychology of how long it takes those memories to go away. And probably part of the um, problem is that they do have fairly long memories. Markets have fairly long memories. So people are thinking back to the problems that we had in 2008 and how much money they lost. And now they're thinking, well, maybe I'll dip a toe back into the water. And they come in on Wednesday, and let's say, again, that 14.25 gets taken out. Those Johnny Cup Lately's might be like, oh, geez, here we go again. I might need to bail out of this market, okay? Now, my big problem with a high-level recovery, this is going to make a little sense, too, because I've, I've got a question here that's going to, uh, dovetail in with this. My problem is you have a market that begins to sell off and it begins to look more like more than just a generic pullback. Like that, that's what a pullback looks like and then this looks like more than pullback, right? And then it comes right back up. Well, it's very hard to mount a new leg on top of this old leg, okay? And that's why I call it a V-shaped recovery but at high levels. So you got a market at high levels, and I didn't draw it big enough, but like that, okay? I'm not talking about a little bit of a pullback like that. It takes off. I'm talking about a more significant, you know, it looks like a big V in the market shape recovery. So it's very hard for a market to be go from overbought to super-duper overbought. And as I said in last week's webcast, Usually, or often, I should say, it runs out of steam at a certain retracement of that prior leg up. Okay, I don't, I wouldn't trade off of that, but I would keep that in the back of my mind for a point where you might want to pull in your horns a little bit. Okay. Okay. Some time ago, you mentioned an economist that you follow to some extent. I am looking for, I don't know that I follow anyone for to some extent, but anyway, I'm looking for a reasonable explanation of what's going on economically. I have friends that are scared to death about where we are headed, so I'd like to find out a voice of reason, not to use in my trading, but just to know what might happen. What was that economist's name? Um, it might have been John Malden because I had a friend that was working for him, uh, but no longer is. So it might have been him, and in one of his presentations, he had mentioned some of the things that the economist had said, and maybe that's what I was talking about. But I'm not a big fan of economists, and hopefully John's not watching. But I find an economist will tell you tomorrow why what he predicted yesterday did not come true today, okay? That's the old joke about economists. So I'm not a big fan of economists because things change. And I think trying to be an economist and trade, there's nothing wrong with being an economist. There's been some very famous ones throughout the years who have accomplished a lot. But I think very few, if any, have ever accomplished anything in trading from a tactical perspective. Okay? I'm a tactical guy. I look for patterns. I look for 
psychology of the players. I don't care what the economy is doing. I hope it does great. I want everybody to have a job. I want everybody to do great. I want everybody to be all they can be, right? But I don't care about that when it comes to the markets, and neither should you. And I think it's a big exercise of futility. If the market is going up, in spite of the economy, if you factor in the economy, then you're like, well, I'm not going to buy stocks, but the market's going up. So you what, sit on your hands? If the market's going down in spite of the economy, then what are you going to do? You're going to hold on to your stocks forever? You're going to lose half your money, like in a year like 2008? So be very careful using the economy or trying to be a economist or following economists for your trading advice. Yeah, it's fascinating to to read some of the things they say and how they talk about situations of world debt and gold and all these other things. That's fun, but it's not a tactical thing. So you can't really time. By tactical, I mean timing, okay? So they're just – timing is really tough with that type of stuff, okay? All right. And I've um, I've quoted – Keynes before. Yeah, Tom, you know, Tom's mentioning a certain individual that I'm not going to mention that I didn't even realize was an economist. And this individual came out with a book saying how the Dow was going to go to 50,000, right? And then the Dow halved in value. We had a couple of bear markets, right? And then he came out with a book and said, you know, the Dow's going to go to zero. And then the market went up 100%. So these you know, I guess I'd, I'm going to sell out one day and write one of these doom and gloom books or prosperity books, sell a bunch of books and just go sit on my boat, right? But, you know, it's amazing how these people try to make these big picture predictions and are so damn wrong, right? Don't get me started. And then they're going to have them on TV. And it's like, wait a minute. This same, can I say it? A-hole was on TV 10 years ago. <laughs> Or 13 years ago, 19, or, you know, 2000, early 2000, tell us about this great prosperity that's going to go on forever. And then the market crashes. You know, and then after the market crashes, it tells you, oh, it's going to zero, and then the market goes up. So, yeah, be careful of those big picture uh, guys like that, okay? Okay, Lewis, we'll get to that. That name rings a bell. So does Quasimodo. Okay, uh, I do occasionally, uh, I've quoted Keynes once or twice. I think Keynes is long dead, I'm guessing. And the only thing, the thing that Keynes says is, uh, which was brilliant, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. A market could stay irrational a lot longer than you could stay solvent. Stocks probably shouldn't be going up right now, right? But they have been, okay? And you'll notice I've got the, my portfolio here in front of you. This is from the service. And, of course, you know, disclaimer purposes, everything is for hypothetical use only, right? Educational use, hypothetical, okay? Um, but, yeah, notice these shorts in here that are still left over, and then the market's going straight up. And what has happened with those shorts? You know, loser, 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 right? But you have to have a stop in place just in case the market keeps going higher, and you're willing to stop out. I think all three of these shorts have unbelievable potential to drop significantly. But the market doesn't seem to care what I think. And one of them is up huge today. Now, the reason I'm showing you the spreadsheet is we have a big winner in the portfolio. And by the way, uh, you can't see some things that are over here. And this is uh, new positions down here I have blacked out for those who are on a service, out of courtesy to you guys. Um, but what you can't see over here is this is the hypothetical model, and I almost spent too much time going over it. But just real quick, we assume on every trade based on this model, there's no compounding, okay, that we have 100 k going in, and we're going to risk 2% on each position, and we're going to split that position into two parts, and one's going to be a trading loaf, and one's going to be a trending loaf. Okay? 
We're only looking for 1% gain on the entire portfolio, the 100K, so $1,000. We're looking for $1,000 on the trading loaf. And we're looking for some multiple on the remaining part of the position. Okay. So the reason I want to show you this, I want to show you the importance. We've got three losers stinking up the joint. And we got one big winner. Now I'm often asked, Dave, well, how, what percentage correct are you? You know, well, it depends on the market. Uh, you know, if the market's doing really well, I might be hitting 70, 80 percent. Okay, and doing really, really well. But I would much rather hit a low percentage correct and make money than in the high percentage correct and not make money. Okay. So let me flesh that out for you. So. Yesterday, um, or day before at least, you know, almost all of these were profitable, and this number was negative, right? Well, I would much rather have some big winners and be profitable than not and have more um, a higher percentage correct. So there are methods out there that are very high correct. Okay, but you're making you're not making a lot of money, and you might even be losing money. I know a lot of people have some systems out there, and they brag about how correct they are, but one or two losers comes along, they're still ninety percent correct, but those one or two losers wipes out a half a year's worth of gains. Okay, so the reason I'm showing you this is the importance of a big winner. Now, like I said, we're looking for one percent on this first loaf in here. Now, by the way, this is tracked mechanically. I'm going to show you how to improve upon this with discretion. But this morning we come in, there's a big gain, and this stock opens at 7.24. So mechanically, we were looking for 6.50, okay, which is one point gain, which would be a thousand dollar gain of one percent, and the market gaps open. So we made 1.7 percent on that position, and on the remaining position, hopefully we make some multiple thereof. Now, before I show you how to squeeze a little bit more out of this first position with discretion, I just want to reiterate the concept of how important it is to have that occasional big winner in the portfolio to keep this number in the black and hopefully nicely in the black. Okay. Now, I wish I had a prettier portfolio to show you, but I don't, but I think this is a very relevant uh, example. So I do like to show the good with the bad, Okay, help temper your expectations a little bit. Now, let's take a look at the stock. Okay. Um, we were looking for 650 on this stock, and then it gapped open. So if you go back to the spreadsheet, you can see that if you exited on the open, following the system mechanically because you've exceeded the profit target of 650, you'd have made this amount of money on that position, right? But notice that it had a little bit of a dip. And then it took off, okay? Now, let's take a look at that intraday. When you have a winner that exceeds your profit target, okay? Your profit target, let's get this right. It's about right there, 650, okay? And you come in and it gaps higher. So you made from there to there in addition to your profit target. There are a couple things you could do. The easiest thing to do especially if you don't have discipline, would be to follow the system mechanically and exit the stock on the open because you have exceeded your profit target. Now, if you have a little bit of discipline, you've already got the your profit target. So you have a bit of a tiger by the tail. You don't know if that stock's going to turn into an opening gap reversal which it did do in the first couple of minutes of trading, or turn around and go straight back up. So what you could do is you could let it open, give it a little bit of room, okay? Now, obviously, if it starts dropping like a stone and comes all the way back down, you better try to get out before that, long before it hits that initial profit target. You don't want to give up all of that little windfall you got, right? But if you give it a little bit of wiggle room within reason to find its opening range, okay? And then as the stock begins to rally, 
you could do a couple of things. One, you could take the Ron Popeil approach. You say, you know what? This thing's got to take it off in here. I'm just going to set a stop below this opening range plus a little wiggle room and set it and forget it like the Showtime Rotisserie 2000 chicken rotisserie 2000 cooker chicken rotisserie thing or whatever he calls it which is in layman's guide by the way I talked about that and what you do is at the end of the day you exit the position if you're not stopped out the beauty of this is it's very hands-off and sometimes by the end of the day you end up pleasantly surprised okay Stock right now is at 818, 819. I can't guarantee it's going to stay there. It's changing as I speak. I'm watching the screen over here. But, you know, round numbers is about 820. So you made a buck 20, so that's an additional $1200 so far on the position. Now, there's no guarantee it's not going to come right back in and stop you out at some point during the day by having the stop way down here. So, number 1, we'll call it the uh, Ron Popeil method. Ron Popeil had the Showtime Rotisserie 2000 where you set it and forget it. You stick a chicken in this thing, you plug it in, you turn it on, you set it and forget it, it dings, your chicken's ready, right? So set it and forget it, go about your life. And at the end of the day, you might find out you're pleasantly surprised. The advantage of this method is that you might write out some serious corrections intraday that you would have surely freaked out and bailed on, and by the end of the day, you end up very, very, very pleasantly surprised. The disadvantage is, obviously, if the market does come back in and stop you out, then you still beat the system by getting this much more than you would have gotten, okay, on the initial profit target, but you give up that opening or you give up whatever gains it made intraday. So the second way of doing this is to trail a stop intraday somewhat loosely, and then exit by the close, okay? The disadvantage of this is it might dip down and take you out, but if that happens, you still make more than you would have just by exiting on the open, okay? And the uh, the advantage, obviously, is if, if it goes way up higher, you can follow it, I'll obviously, the other day, get a lot of money, or let's say it does begin to implode in earnest, you capture the crux of that game. Let's say this pullback keeps pulling back, you get stopped out around here, then it drops down. By the end of the day, it actually goes negative, okay? So you can take, number one, the rod from peel, set it and forget it method. Number two, you can trail intraday. Trail, A-I-A-I-L, trail, intraday, okay? And you could use some sort of moving average. You could you could say, okay, it's, um, you know, it's now up here at 773. I'm going to bump my stop to 740. And let's say it goes to 8, which it has done. Maybe I'll go to 760. You know, you can move that up. Your be careful. Don't try to chase it up too, too much because you'll stop and go straight up, and then it'll knock you out, and it'll take off again, okay? But anyway, there are ways of beating the system, and I just want to show you that now. And it's very important to occasionally beat the system so you get that windfall in. So, for instance, in this particular case, you know, knock on wood, so far, so good. But let's say it's at 820. We were looking for a 650, okay, and then we squeezed out, let's say the 820 minus 720, which is one point. You squeezed out an extra $1,000 so far, hopefully so far is a key word in that sentence, um, but you squeezed out an extra $1,000 on the position, which on that portfolio is an extra percent on your account. In fact, in no matter how much money you have in your account, based on the money management, you have actually made another percent on top of what you would normally have made following the system mechanically. And then maybe by the end of the day, it keeps on running. So it's a little trick, a little tip to use to help you squeeze out an additional profit, okay? All right, John Dearborn, great show again, Dave. The quote you were searching for is from T.S. Eliot. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see this. We must not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we began and to know the place for the first time. Yeah, it's like you get you 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 go through this holy grail hunt, and then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, it was there all along in the chart. And my favorite thing that I often talk about when it comes to markets is. 
two things. One, and I know I'm going to make it sound way too easy. And trust me, I have the same emotions that you and anyone else or any you know, anyone out there has. Okay, we all have emotions when it comes to this business. Just because you became a trader doesn't mean your emotions have ceased. All you have to do to profit in a market is to sell higher than you buy. Okay? So from there to there, here's a trend. Or to cover lower than you shorted. So focus on price because you're only going to get paid on price. You're not going to get paid if the stochastic goes from 80 down to 70 or from 70 up to 80 or the RSI inverts or whatever. You only get paid if price goes higher if you're buying or price goes lower if you're selling short. So focus first and foremost on price. Learn how to read charts. Okay. And then... Maybe add an indicator or two here and there if you find that it helps you to read the charts. Okay? Great quote, John. Thanks for sharing that. I'm going to have to figure out a way to cut, cut and paste that out. Okay. Oh, I didn't hear what RP stands for. RP is Ron Papil. Ron Papil, uh, he had a Showtime, you know, do do a Google on Showtime rotisserie chicken. I wrote about it in the book. Uh it's set it and forget it was his uh, mantra on that when he did his advertorials. All right, let's uh, let's knock out this email. Okay, why do you require the overall market to make a new high after a correction and then wait for setups on a pullbacks on pullbacks to establish new long positions? You are not a breakout trader. I get that, and I get that you wait for a pullback to make sure the market tests the breakout and resumes. Why don't you regard the market the same way you would a stock that is pulled back in an uptrend? I do. Okay. I know I must be missing something in translation. What? Just looking from the perspective of bow ties, if we were to trade the market as a trending once a bow tie is evident, as trending once a bow tie is evident, why wait for do how to confirm the trend resume? Thanks in advance. Okay. You ask a lot in that. So let's just kind of pick it apart and talk about a few things. Obviously, here's the no-brainer part. Thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust. We get a market that looks like that, and you draw your big blue arrow. In this case, it's red. That's a no-brainer. You're trading pullbacks, trading pullbacks, trading pullbacks. You don't just jump in blindly here because you don't know when that correction is coming. Okay? You wait for the correction so you know you have a chance for that market to revert back to the B. So when a market looks like that, it's a no-brainer. When a market looks like this, it becomes a little bit more difficult, okay? Is this the pullback a start of something new? It might be. I have some patterns to, to uh, help, I don't want to say quantify, but help qualify that, right? And then this is where it becomes very difficult. Let's say you have that leg, okay? Well, this leg here, so far is a retracement of the prior leg. So it just looks like this, right? And it's just beginning to retrace back up. Now you don't have, again, that generic thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust. So a lot of problems happen when you have a market that sells off hard, doesn't follow through, but then begins to retrace. You don't know if this leg here is going to be a new leg for a long, long time until it maybe takes out that old high, could stay there, and then kind of pulls back and goes into that thrust, pull back, rinse, and repeat mode. Okay. A lot of times, like we spent a lot of time talking about last week, a market has a sharp sell off, has a sharp retracement, and then stalls out, stalls short of those prior highs. You also have the potential, from a classical technical analysis standpoint, that that market could end up being a double top. Now, in markets, a lot of times the market will overshoot that double top and then stall out and come back in. That's where we're talking about Derek, Derek's Hobbs uh, shark attack pattern, right? Where, as I've said quite a bit, it's very hard to mount a new leg on top of an old leg in these V-shaped recoveries. 
Now, he talked about bow ties. Well, a bow tie is a transitional pattern that should be used mostly, if not only, after major, major highs. Right there, we have a multi-year high. And then here we have a bow tie that's fairly tight. By tight, I mean it sort of looks like this, right? It's kind of all together. It's not, you know, one moving average is this, and then does that, and this one's kind of, you know, doing that. Here you have a pretty close or pretty tight fulcrum. Notice that it swapped over here, and then, you know, you're only a couple days later, or this happened a couple days after this first crossing here. So it kind of all came together fairly tightly, okay? You see that kind of fairly tight here? And it's also after multi-year highs. This bow tie here, it crossed here, and then you get crosses here. So it's a little bit more looser and slightly and sloppily formed. Yes, they still flipped over, and yes, the market has headed higher. But the thing you need to realize is a bow tie here coming off of these high levels is more significant than a bow tie here, okay, because it's this is a high-level correction. On this bow tie here, anybody who bought prior to this high all of a sudden is now being – is at a profit at this point. But as soon as that market begins to drop, they're now at a loss, okay? So the most amount of people are going to be trapped on the wrong side of the market during that bow tie, during a bow tie that occurs after multi-year and ideally all-time highs. Conversely, on the short side, in fact, let's take a look at one on the short side. This is the SPWR that we just looked at. Look how beautiful and look how tight that little bow tie is, all right? It all came together at one little point. This is a multi-year low. This stock was 120 bucks at one point in time. It went sideways for over a year. This is the Phoenix strategy I talk about often or, you know, or have been in more recent times. And it's one of my favorite patterns because the market goes down, makes that long, 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 long base, gets rid of a lot of bad memories, and then you look to trade the transition. I'm more excited about trading the transition off of all-time lows at a stock like this and notice that it has since doubled in value, bam, right, then a high-level type of situation where you got a stock or a market, whatever, sells off. Okay, that's the good bow tie here. That could often be your all-time or major, major top. And then you get, like, one of these minor signals that come up here, okay? Well, the market's still at high levels. It could easily drop a long, long way. So that's why I'm not that excited about this bow tie in here. That's reason number one. I require this market to go to new highs, okay? Reason number two is it's so far, it's just kind of retracing back to its old highs. So I want to see it prove itself by taking out those old highs and beginning to stick there. Now, as I wrote in the newsletter this morning, I'm glad you asked me this question after I wrote what I wrote. But as I wrote the newsletter this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about it in a few minutes too, but I'm getting far ahead of myself. But the thing is, the market direction is very hard to predict in this event driven type of environment. So far it just looks like a big retracement in here and there's the danger that it could turn into a double top. Or even if it gets past that prior high, there's a danger, like I've been saying, with that V-shaped recovery that it could run out of steam mounting that leg on top of that leg. So that's what's got to be concerned about this market. And on top of that, again, because there's so much crazy news, physical cliff, physical cliff, physical cliff, physical cliff, physical cliff. Hey, it's, it's going, it's going, yay, I'm going to tell all my friends, right? Oh, and then guess what? Next week it's going to be back, okay? I can pretty much guarantee you that. And somebody pointed out while I was on a radio show, there's like three components of this fiscal cliff, so to speak, so-called fiscal cliff, I should say. People have been asking me locally, Dave, what do you think about the physical cliff? And I'm like... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we should jump off it. Um, I digress. But, yeah, it's very hard for a market to mount a leg on top of an old leg coming off a high. So if you just had a generic correction in here and then it took off again, let's just say like right here, if it just had this little bit of correction and then took off again, that's a different story. That's just trend following 101. 
it gets complex when you have a sharp, sharp, sharp retracement down or sharp sell-off down, followed by a sharp retracement back up. That's a little tougher. And if you go in and watch the webinar I did on December 20th, I just posted it, by the way, if you want to see that, I talked about pattern versus trend. And I think your answer might be in that webinar, okay? So there will be some cases where you'll have a pattern, let's say a double top, okay? Where, yeah, the short-term trend is up. And I guess if you're measuring from the peak, you know, you're, you're somewhat to be in terms of trend to sideways. But you will have a pattern, a possible turning pattern, such as a double top. Not that I trade off a double top, but I pay attention to it. So it becomes pattern versus trend. Ideally, you want pattern and trend to work together. And some of my, some of my patterns actually dovetail in nicely. Sometimes you get that double top, and then you get that bow tie, or you get that head and shoulders top that looks something like this, and then this becomes a gatekeeper, okay? And we talked about that a lot last week, okay? So part of the answer to your question is pattern versus trend. And that's why I can't get excited just because this market is, even though it's going up in here. And you know what? I've waited this long. Might as well wait a little while longer. Let's see it makes some new highs. But as I said in the newsletter, and lately, not to be cliche, but it is a bit of a stock picker's market. And because of all the news and the news that's flowing in, because this thing it's either retracing or starting a new leg up. But if it starts a new leg up, it's not like Jackie Mason. It's going to be hard to sustain a new leg up. I'm beating a dead horse. I know it. But so because of all that going on, and because next week they're going to come out with a new fiscal cliff or whatever, and there's going to be some new news flowing into the environment, very hard to get the market direction right at this juncture. It looked pretty obvious a few weeks ago. It looked obvious like that it was going to roll over, but it didn't. So now we're left with an environment where it's very hard to get that market direction backing you. So it becomes more of a stock picker's environment. I like these solar stocks, or I liked them a couple of weeks ago when they were just beginning to rally off those bases, because I thought they had the potential to move in spite of what the overall market was doing. Okay, And that's why I like those. So I think we're in a bit of that stock picker's market where we're going to have to be very, very, very selective. And I knew you probably think, Dave, you always say be selective. And I do. But if we get the rip-roaring bull market, then you could get a little bit more sloppier. And by sloppy, I don't mean, you know, throw caution to the wind. But, yeah, you got something that looks a little mediocre. It looks good, but not great. Then go ahead go for it. Right now, I want to find something that could trade contrary to the overall market, something with a little excitement in it, like solar, something maybe high in volatility, like solar, you know kind of have a love-hate relationship with those kind of stocks. You're either going to make a fortune or you're going to lose your butt. And hopefully stops will take you out if it's the latter of those two. Okay? So it's price versus trend. And ideally you want both. But because of the pattern, I'm sorry, it's pattern versus trend. And ideally you want both. But because of the pattern in the market, I'm more focused right now on pattern than trend. And the trend, if anything, is yes, it's up shorter term over the last three, four weeks, right? But it's also very, very overbought. So that's where the, the pattern aspect or the characteristic of the market comes into play. And that's why, even though we're at this multi week high, it's hard for me, or multi month high, I guess to get bullish at this juncture, okay? I've got to beat the dead horse on that. Hopefully, the question has been answered. Uh, last week's show, I think, will answer a lot of questions on that, too, okay? Maybe Gartment can help. He is a trader that talks economics. Oh, okay. I'm not sure who who he or she is, but, uh, okay, I'll, I'll Google him, her. <coughs> Gartman. Yeah, it sounds familiar. Dennis Gartman. Oh, okay. Don't know who that is. The name sounds familiar, though. I mean, my apologies, Mr. Gartman. You know, I'm sure he's never heard of me either. <laughs> so, all right, let's get rid of RSTLNE. Lately, that's just been uh, Apple. And um, that's a little canary in a coal mine. It's, I just can't take this graphic out. This is one of my favorite. This is my absolute favorite graphic that I put in my uh, newsletter of 2000. And 12, 
But you know, this is that's this is the kind of thing you need to watch. You talk about pattern and price and everything coming together. You got the bow tie, little first thrust coming off of all time highs, a thrust down, a little pullback. You know, see that's easy to trade. Thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback. Right. Okay, let's just get Apple out the way because we're going to get asked. Obviously, it was in pretty serious trend. And then here, now here's a case. Look, this Apple was going up, right? But to me, that just looks like a big picture retracement, okay? And that's why I didn't say, well, you got a trend here. And I don't have a bow tie on it. We'll throw one on it in a minute if you want when we get to the charts. But it probably bow tied in here. But I'm not interested in a bow tie at this high level. I'm interested in a bow tie here, okay? High level meaning that it's still high compared to what stock was years ago, right? So I'm interested in that transition. A bow tie is a transitional pattern. It's not a trend resumption pattern. It's not intended to be thrust, you know, big correction, bow tie up. That's not what it's made for. It's made for long-term trend, long-term trend dies, you get a bow tie or a first thrust or some other transitional type of pattern. Anyway, 500, support in Apple. Downtrend still intact, finding a little support around 500, rallying off of that, obviously. But if 500 gets taken out, I think 400 would be a chip shot, okay? But at this point, it's no longer tradable because now it would have to make new lows. It would have to come down here plus and then pull back afterwards for me to get excited again because now this is no longer this, okay? Thrust. Pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, which is which hat, okay? So you had one signal, two signal, this is your third signal, okay? And now it's just kind of, notice that it didn't really make a significant new low. So we don't trade this pattern here. We don't trade this pullback, even though you have a little bit of a downtrend here, right? We only trade these type of pullbacks. So it's going to have to break to new lows and then pull back before we look to trade it again. That's what we do as pullback traders, okay? That's our methodology. We're sticking to it. But 500 is support for Apple, and I guess, I don't know if you had to say resistance, maybe that prior little witch hat looking or deep retracement looking high around 600 would be the next uh, upside target. But I think, um, I think Apple's still in trouble. And if it takes out 500, I think a lot of people are probably watching 500, by the way. Nice, big, fat, round number, okay? Uh, if it stalls this 600 short, trade feasible? No. Okay. He wants to know that, uh, John wants to know, well, should I short it if it gets to 600? Well, problem now becomes just draw your line through as many bars as possible, okay? So this is what that would look like at 600. Well, this, we don't trade this. We don't trade this pattern here, okay? Because it didn't make a new low. We're trying to catch trend. Pull back, trend, pull back. Look at this TKO back here, okay? You got a gap higher here. You know, it's wide and loose. We don't trade all this, right? But then the stock breaks out. It makes a nice, nice, nice trend higher. It makes a TKO here. You're looking to trade that TKO, okay? Another TKO here, okay? Thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back. Well, it didn't work here, right? Doesn't always work. But at this point, Notice how deep this pullback is and this retracement up. You're actually getting like a gatekeeper pattern in here. So you're getting a different pattern. Okay. Notice that pattern and not trend. Okay. That's a transitional type of pattern. And it's kind of all over the place. But you can see now, just draw your lines through the charts and see what you had, see what you have. Okay. And to get back to 600, no, that would not be a short. Would it be overbought at that level? Am I interviewing myself? Yes. It would be overbought at that level. Would I short it there? No, it's not. Doesn't fit my methodology. Okay. And by the way, follow one methodology and just one methodology, right? If you start switching methodologies or try to do too many things, you're going to get uh, screwed up in your analysis. Okay. Uh, just a little random thoughts, just to kind of close the loop on a couple things. Um, you know, hey, seasonality didn't work last year. Well, it almost didn't work. Okay. The market bases the peas in December, everybody's all excited about the December rally, right? Was actually down three quarters of a percent. And then what happened last day of the year, it rallies up one day. It rallies up a percent and a half. Okay. 
well, you can, so statistically, you're going to say, oh, well, what up 0.75% or 75, yeah, 0.75% in December. Yay, you know, seasonality, I told you it would work, right? Well, you'd have lost money that entire month. So at what point in time would you have bailed out losing money because the market's supposed to go out, supposed to go up, I'm sorry, not out, or go out the year, I guess I should say, higher, okay? So the point I'm just trying to make here is even though the market went higher, I'm not eating any crow, but I'm just saying that even though the market went higher and even though seasonality worked, you could not trade off of seasonality in and of itself. Okay, A lot of people get excited about the December seasonality, and this 0.75 gain we had in December, even though it just took place over one day, which erased the entire month's losses, right? It'll still statistically be valid as far as seasonality is concerned. But don't get too excited about seasonality. I had that day not come along and the market would have slid a little bit more. I think the slide would have been exacerbated because everybody was expecting that seasonality. Okay. Um, again, don't read too much into the news. So we didn't go off the fiscal cliff. Was anything created? And I know I'm confusing confusing the issue with facts, right? But seriously, was anything created? And the answer is no, nothing was created. Did they do something that's going to give us jobs and, and, and pump money into the economy and, and just be great? No, they, they raised taxes, but they didn't raise them as much as everybody was worried they would. And, you know, Wait a minute, net net, what happened? They raised taxes, okay? So how is that going to help the market? Now I'm not smart enough to figure out the news, so if someone out there could tell me and give me a plausible explanation, then I'm willing to follow it, okay? And we already touched upon this. I think the, there's some hot money running into this market, and it's a stock pickers market, okay? All right, any question? about anything so far before we start jumping in charts. Uh, if you want to start start asking about individual uh, stocks, feel free to do that now. And then um, I'm going to cover the overall market real quick, and then we'll hop into your questions. Okay. Uh, Lewis is asking, what themes do you see setting up for the near term? What sectors are bullish and bearish on? Okay. Um, well, I'm not – bullish or bearish on that many sectors at this juncture. I'm a little concerned about these high-level V-shaped recovery areas like the overall market. For instance, biotech, because biotech did this, and now it's, uh, let's see, did this, I think it made like a double top. It's rallied back up, or wait a minute, it's doing something like that. I forget what it's doing, but I'm a little concerned. Yeah, it's doing this. It has a potential double top in the works. A lot of these areas look like that, okay? The ones that have broken out, I'm worried about their being extended from that V-shaped recovery. Okay, The ones that have not broken out but have made these strong recoveries, I'm worried about them stalling out at double tops. The only areas I like, there's only one really that I sort of like on the long side now, I still like, is solar because it's made these long, 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 long bottoms and now it's begun to take off. Okay, And I guess it's because... You know, and a present company included, you know, last time they tried to rally off the of lows, I got all excited. That was a year or two ago. And then they came right back in and went sideways. It might have been four years ago. Uh, and I got burnt on a few of those, no pun intended. But now it looks like we're going to get paid. That's a hard thing to do, too, is go back to the market in an area where you get burnt, right? But maybe now it's the real deal. So I'm bullish there. Um, I'm still a little bearish on retail, but check back often. I'm getting kind of burnt there pretty hard. We're getting close to a stop on one. You know, maybe I might have to um, change my tune on that. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the um, – let's get let's get the charts out the way. And I think we'll, have, we'll still have plenty of time to get to everybody's questions. So let's do this. Let's take a look at the overall market. And uh, let's look at the micro, and let's work our way out. Although I think I've already pontificated quite a bit about the market, but let's just let's just knock it out real quick. Okay. Um, 
we had the big rally yesterday, and you know, while I was doing the show, the market did turn higher. So it's like, you know, well, yay, I'm telling my friends. Market goes straight up. And then it kind of flat lines today. Okay. You know, just for fun, let's do this. We got time. This is what it looks like intraday. You got yesterday. Where does today start? Yesterday it goes from here to here, although it did flatline a little bit. And then today it goes. It just goes sideways. It always amazes me that you have these huge ups, up days, and then the market just kind of dies afterwards. Now, let's get back to the peas or the cash market. Okay. Look, getting back to the cash. Well, right at these uh, new highs in here. So, yeah, that's always a good thing, but not to beat a dead horse. My concern is that, you know, you got this V-shaped recovery, sort of. It's a little sloppy now that we had this little sell-off in here. Okay, and it just looks like it's going to be hard to sustain. But, hey, if it breaks up the new highs, market comes up here, then I might begin to change my tune. Right now, I'm being real selective. I'm keeping an eye out on both sides of the market. Ideally, you know me, I want a long-term bull market thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, rinse and repeat over and over again. Okay, one thing I have been watching in the P's that you may or may not have seen <laughs> That's always funny when some of the, you may or may not have seen this. Well, as opposed to what you know, it did have a bit of a head and shoulders look to it. It still has a bit of a retrace look to it. It's kind of this V recovery thing again to it. That's a weekly chart. So until it makes new highs, I wouldn't get too excited about this. And getting back to the question that uh, Matt had posed, good question, is uh, it's it's pattern versus trend at this point that I'm looking at mostly. Once we make new highs and the market starts, it can, if it keeps rallying, then we're back to looking at trend versus pattern, okay? Now let's take a look at the quack. NASQUAC, as you know, is kind of melted straight up in here, okay? Uh, retracement there is a little bit more serious, though, in the P's. You see this reverse check mark, and let me let me take the chart out. Okay, you see how that looks. Whenever you get these reverse check marks in here, that's again that's that V-shaped problem, and it's also a retracement problem. Sometimes the markets, as you know, stall out when they retrace when they're retracing back to their old highs. Okay, I stopped short of saying that Fibonacci word, but sometimes that does happen. And I will admit that, and I did talk a little bit about that in the last uh, webinar that I did. But anyway, NASDAQ kind of melting up in here. You got a bit of an air pocket in here, or a gap, whatever you want to call that. So uh, that's, that's, that might be a little fodder for research, see if this gap comes in and gets uh, tested and or filled in here. So, but hard to predict this market at this juncture because it's very, very overbought and due to correct. The nature of that correction will be important if it corrects, it keeps on correcting and takes out Monday's close, just like we talked about in the P's, then I'd be very concerned about that, okay? So that's a NASDAQ. The set correction, um, this is the biotech I was talking about. It thrusted up. It made this kind of double top. It to sell off, but now it's tested that top one more time. I have a hard time getting excited about a market that looks like that, okay? And again, just draw your lines in here. This, I like. This, okay, I don't like too much, okay? So, and I think if, if you walk away with anything today and you're a little bit newer to trading, is, is draw your lines on these charts so you see what you actually have, okay? Biotech right now looks like this. You got a possible double top being tested in the works, which might turn into a triple top. Who knows? Okay. So make sure you, you look at your charts from that perspective before deciding or getting bullish or bearish. And then the most simplest thing you could ever do when looking at a chart is just draw a horizontal line. I mean, how easy, how much easier could it get, right? Where is biotech now? Where was biotech three, four, five months ago? Okay. Where is gold now? Where was gold two years ago? Okay. 
we'll, we'll look at that if you want. Um, so it hasn't made much forward progress on a net net basis. So every now and then, take a step back and look at a market on a net net basis. Okay. Um, so a lot of sectors are looking like that. You do have a few sectors that have broken out. I can't get too excited about them just yet. Uh, something like the chemicals broke out yesterday to new highs. I mean, who knows? I might be in trend following mode on these stocks soon, provided they stay well above this breakout level and then maybe look to play that first pullback. But I'm more excited about something that's maybe making a longer term bottom at this juncture. For instance, let's take a look at like foods. Okay, foods have been doing really well and they pulled back and they broke out again yesterday. So that's trend following one on one, and that looks pretty good. If you go look at my Landry list, I have a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, my Landry 100. I have a lot of foods in that momentum list, and I've been tracking them, and they've been going higher. But I'm not too excited about trading these because they're at such high levels, and they were the only game in town for a long time. And I think if the market continues to rally, some of these areas could become a source of funds. Now you're probably thinking, but Gabe, you preach trend, trend, trend. And in general, I do. But in a case like this, where the market's a little questionable and, th and there's so much going on, these stocks that were in trends, the trend may be coming to the end on that. I know it's a little counterintuitive but hard to understand, but at this juncture, I sort of like some of these stocks that are coming off of these low levels as opposed to these prior winners. When you have a bit of a spill in the market, the prior winners sometimes can become a source of funds because they survive that spill. And it's a little counterintuitive, I know. I don't want to get too far into that because we've talked about it so much in the past. Let's just look at gold because everybody wants to look at gold. And then let's take a look at bonds, and then we'll uh, open it up for uh, individual stock questions. So let's just punch up gold real quick. And here's the thing. Um, you know, I've got a lot of people asking. You know, people have been asking me about investments. And unfortunately, as I told someone, literally New Year's Eve and New Year's Eve party, there are no investments at this juncture that I can think of, okay, when it comes to the markets. Gold has gone sideways for, what, a year and a half or two years. Just draw your line in there. Yeah, it's zig back, zigzag back and forth. But that's not a good investment because you've, uh, you know, it depends on where you bought in these cycles. You're either underwater or let's just say you bought somewhere average. You've, you've made absolutely nothing for two years, okay? And that might continue for a while. And then shorter term... It's headed lower, and then shorter, shorter term, it's pulled back, okay? But there's a lot of support under the market, so it doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere fast in here. So that's gold. I just want to show you bonds real quick. Let's take a look at the TLT. And bonds are beginning to break down. And when bonds begin to break down, or when, when it sounds like my cage slipped out, bonds begin to break down. <laughs> uh, when bonds go lower, as you know, rates are going higher. So it looks like rates are going a little bit higher in here you do have a little support right in this area here but if that gets taken out it could get pretty ugly pretty fast as I've been preaching for months and months and months and months and months uh, if you got to do something regarding interest rates now might be the time to pull the trigger and you know, I hope I'm wrong and I hope they go to zero I want to provide that that will be help, help you out um, and then you can always refinance down the road but especially now it's beginning to break down now may be a good time to pull the trigger. I don't get paid for that advice, so it's free advice. It's worth uh, every dime, right, that you paid for it, so don't come after me. And this is just for educational purposes only, of course. All right, let's uh, open it up for our questions in here. I don't see any reason to get too f much further into these sectors um, at this juncture. I like to see the overall market trend a little bit before getting too excited about any individual areas. Okay, uh, Don wants to know about Facebook. Don also left, so we can talk about him. That's Don Jane. That's not uh, Don for Don. I think he's here too. Okay. Um, Facebook has been doing okay as of late, as you know, but it's a little too wide and loose, and I think it also has uh, some recent bad memories. I think a lot of people came in here. And then also it had some trading around between, uh, let's just say, 28 and 32 round numbers, right? So I think it's going to have a hard time getting through that area. And if you just looked at the short term on this, eh, it's just kind of, you know, all over the place. So there's nothing there for me to get excited about. Okay. Web, 
WBMD, about a five-month base, thrust and pullback. Don, I see you. I'm getting to it. Don't worry. Don, you were finally vindicated on that Ford, by the way. Yeah, I see what you're saying. This stock sort of made a nice little base down here. Unfortunately, it tried to break out, but came way back in. Okay, it came way, 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 way back in. Okay, so you can't really say that you want to trade this stock here, even though it's traded higher. It would have to get out of this low-level base decisively and then pull back for me to get excited about it. Okay, uh, just because of all the trading you've got at this level here. You also got this gap down, and that's not that far back. So I think you've got some bad memories in this stock, and I think you're going to have bad memories all the way up. Now, if there were a way to do it, and I can't do it with this software, but if you could move this base, if this base goes out a year or two, then these bad memories tend to go away. God forbid some of the people who own the stock back here die, their children get it, they, they cash it in just because they, you know, they're... <laughs> picking the bones, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Sorry, I'm getting giddy. Uh, all that Mountain Dew's kicked in. Uh, but anyway, yes, yeah, so people die. People's opinions change. People, uh, not opinions change, but, um, you know, things happen. People have to sell a stock to pay money or uh, pay money, to pay uh, taxes or whatever. And so those bad memories get behind you. But right now, I think those bad memories are a little too close. So I wouldn't see that as a... Um, a base breakout type of play. Take a look, for instance, at like SPWR, for example, which is our uh, great example of today, by the way. And let's take a look at that. And let me show you what I saw in that versus something like the WebMD. This thing makes these all-time lows in here. It comes down, retest them a little bit, just shy of the lows here. Uh, you know, it was up around uh, five times the amount it was. Not a whole lot of resistance in here. That resistance is about a year or two back. You know, and it, 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 so it started this, the base tightened up in here. It broke out of the base. You got the bow tie, the pullbacks, the whole nine yards, okay? It's just a real clean, clean setup. It didn't, like, come out and then come all the way back in um, like they sometimes do and then go back to basing for another five or ten years, right? So that's why I'm excited about a stock that looks like that versus, like, a WebMD, okay? All right, let me get Ford out the way before Don has a fit. <laughs> Ford chart of term looks pretty damn good. All of these, um, pretty darn good, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, all of these automotive stocks have been rallying as of late. Um, there was nothing for me to get excited about Ford when it was coming off these lows, even though it was multi-year lows. And, you know, like somebody asked me earlier, Matt was asking me, you know, what about following the bow ties? Well, yeah, you can follow the bow ties. I mean, this is a downtrend bow tie here, this is an uptrend bow tie here, you know, this is a downtrend one, this is an uptrend one. The only problem is you might end up chasing your own tail sometimes before you eventually catch that trend. Nothing wrong with that. I, I notice the bloggers sometimes, they tend to get it wrong because they'll point out, or at least they don't realize the, the author's intent of the pattern, and they'll talk about these bow ties at high, at high levels going back up as opposed to bow ties at high levels turning down okay but yeah it's headed higher Don it's making new highs I can't argue with that so on a pullback maybe you know it's gonna have some bad memories to it but I hear you I mean if you're sitting on a wad of it there's no need to get out of it at this juncture alright let's take a look at how do you scan for sector trades well I look at all of these um, Morningstar industry groups in here, and I also look at a bunch of ETFs, see what's going on within the sectors, okay? And I could say, you know, okay, well, insurance, hey, it broke out. There's insurance breaking out, so I kind of keep a, uh, I'll make a note of sectors that are breaking out. I'll make a note of sectors that are doing well. Also, I like to look at ETFs, well, usually about 100K or more, but I also have some smaller ETF listed here, like ETF 20K. And I'll give you the, the – it's just volume filters. I'll give them to you, but I think it's like one line or a few captures on that. And, and looking at those Morningstar industry groups, which are great little groups, by the way, if you don't have Telechart, you should, and you should use my link because I told you about it, right? <laughs> so I look at all 239, each and every one of these daily, and that gives me a good feel for what's going on with the sectors. I don't necessarily run out and make a sector trade. 
Although, if I am bullish, bullish, bullish on a sector, and I'm not seeing any stocks within the sector that are set up, I might take a setup in an ETF and then look for that inefficient stock to go higher. And I'll give you an example. Like, you know, I liked a lot of these solar stocks, but then TAN just kind of dropped like a rock. It's taken off today. But I didn't like what the ETF was doing. But let's say I liked the ETF and weren't and didn't see a whole lot of stocks that I liked, or at least that were set up, I should say. Then I might uh, go for the ETF to gain some exposure. CENX, okay. CENX, okay. Uh, very wide and loose. A lot of these metals and mining lately have been a little wide and loose. Uh, it's going to really have to clear some of this fluff back here and then pull back for me to get excited about it. I hear you, though. Uh, it did hit a fairly significant low in here. What's about a five, ten year low? About a five year low. It has rallied off of it. So, yeah, it sort of looks like it's bottomed out. But I would go through the rest of the metals and see what else uh, is out there. There might be something uh, nice. Don, you, Don asked about Ford 15 times. You only have to ask once, Don. <laughs> I know you're here. <laughs> G and W after a pullback, all right? G and W. Uh, well, the problem with that is, now it might be a good problem to have, but you have this uh, this overhead supply further back in here. You got a little overhead supply here, and then you got some overhead supply here. So, and it's kind of wide loose. So you might be able to find something a little bit better to trade. I hear you though; it's broken out, and now it's beginning to accelerate higher. But it could run into trouble really quick. So I would find something that has a little bit clearer air above it. AXL. Uh, now, Don, you know, that's electrocardiogram. Why Why would you ask about that? Seriously. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. All right, Don, you can see electrocardiogram award of the day. Let me see if I can find it. Electro, electric money. Here we go. And the winner is Don with electrocardiogram. Let's see if I can get it over here. Uh, let's see. Here we go. There you go, Don. Boop, boop, boop. Take a look at Axel. It's up, it's down, it's up. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. That's electric cardiogram. Take a look at Axel. All right. Crazy. That doesn't fit the methodology. You know better. GT. All right. Let's see if we can pick on Don some more. Oh, look at that. He wins the second electric cardiogram award of the day. Yeah, I hear you. It's breaking out shorter term. But it's a big, thick stock. It's all over the place. Difficult to trade. So I would leave that one alone, too. Okay? All right. The question is, how about MTU? Looks good. And many in foreign bank stocks, nice basis. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the foreign stocks, especially foreign banks, doing fairly well in here. The stock is MTU. I've never heard of it. Woo. You get electric order to have a war, too. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, is it? Am I saying it right, Lewis? Uh, yeah, it's just kind of all over the place, okay. But I hear you. At least in this particular case, it's going sideways for a long, long time. And you know, if it breaks out of this, then yes, baby, okay. But that's that's a crazy, uh, that's kind of crazy stock. <laughs> uh, WPI for Tom. Hey, Tom. I like Tom. Tom's in my service. That's why I like him. Uh, yeah, possible short. That's beautiful. Yeah, you know, got a little breakdown there. You got a little bit of first thrust. Let me tell you what I like about the stock. Very stealthy setup. Very, very, very stealthy setup, okay? You got to really look hard. You can see you got a thrust out, a little bit of a pullback. It is a little bit uh, low at HV. That's probably why it doesn't jump out at you. Let's put a bow tie in here and take a look at it. Yeah, that's going to turn into a bow tie suit. Absolutely. That's beautiful. It's a possible short, right? WPI, but yeah, first high five of the day. That looks like a possible short. WPI, ooh, daddy like. Is that what you're just looking at? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Second high five of the day. How's that? <laughs> ALJ broke out with a large wide range bar, but currently only pulled back a bit. What's the current entry point for that? ALJ, 
ALJ. Well, I'm not going to chase a stock on a wide range bar, okay? Uh, this is a little too extreme. When you see a stock take off on a wide range bar, you know, yes, you want wide range bars, but you don't want them too, too extreme. Like this one here, eh, it's not too crazy. A little bit of a pullback there above its base. I could say, okay, I could see where you could get long on that. But on such a wide range bar, I find stocks tend to chop around a little bit. So I would leave that stock alone. I mean, it looks okay. I hear you. It's coming off a of base. It's not bad. But I would leave it alone. Okay. Great show again. Okay. Thank you. Um, I asked more than once just in case you were putting some holiday cheer and then I do you were drinking. <laughs> you want to look at Ford again, Don? Okay, we'll do it. <laughs> a and R have to break out the pullback. We talk about that one, Alexander. Let me let's take a look at that. A and R, yeah, A and R is what a uh, metal stock. It's just too wide and loose, you know. But I hear you in that it might be making a bottom in here. But it's a little, it's a tiny bit electrocardiogram. But yeah, long term bottom. You know, it's going down for a long, long time. Okay, kind of bottoming out. It does have some bad memories around 20, but hey, that's 100% up. Yeah, you know, this could turn into something, but maybe I would wait for it to break out of this low-level base, okay, and then maybe start thinking about it. But And you don't, here's the beauty of um, having a database. You don't have to watch this stock every day as long as you've got scans set up you'll see it when it begins to happen. In other words, you don't have to specifically analyze ANR every day, okay? Joy for Don, I bet it's wide and loose and thick. <laughs> yes, it is. No, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up. <laughs> you know, maybe if you're reversion to the bean trader, that's what you want to trade. It's all over the place. How do you trade a stock like that? Sell if it goes up, buy if it goes down. Tex. Um, did we talk about this one already? Yeah, I mean, it's breaking out, but it's also wide and loose. You know, again, again, fairly thick stock here. It's got some bad memories. You know, I'd much rather trade a stock. I keep coming back to SPWR. That's made like a nice base and it's broken out and made like a bow tie and all these other things as opposed to trading some stock that's just all over the place. Okay. All right. Any more questions? We're pretty close to the time limit on here. If it gets any longer, it's a little hard to manage. While we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I have a blast doing these. Don, thanks for coming so I could pick on you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I do have a blast doing these shows. As you can tell, it's the highlight of my week. And I'm flattered that you guys would show up. Uh, for them, and as long as you do, uh, I'll keep coming because, uh, you know, from a selfish standpoint, I, I get a lot out of them too, so thank you so much. It makes me think and it makes me want to become better at what I do. Um, everyone have a good weekend if we don't talk again. Uh, any unanswered questions, feel free to shoot me an email or anything you want covered next week. Shoot me an email, daviddavelandry.com. Happy New Year, everyone, and we'll talk again, I guess, next week if that's in there. Thank you so much.